majesty worship his majesty unto jesus be your glory honor and praise majesty kingdom authority flow from his throne unto his own his anthem raise so exalt lift up on high the name of jesus magnify come glorify christ jesus the king majesty worship his majesty flow from his throne unto his own his anthem raise so we exalt lift up on high the name of Jesus magnify come glorify Christ Jesus the King majesty worship his majesty Jesus who died now glorified King of all kings Majesty Worship His Majesty Unto Jesus Be all glory, honor and praise majesty kingdom authority flow from his throne not to his own his anthem raise so exalt lift up on high the name of jesus magnify come glorify christ jesus the king majesty worship his majesty Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. Jesus who died, now glorified, Jesus who died, now glorified, Jesus who died, now glorified. King of all kings. Give him praise today. God, we honor and praise your holy name. We began a series of messages uh, last week entitled, Better Choices, Better Life. How many of you know that the choices we make in life determine our destiny and our future. How important it is to make quality choices because quality choices means we will have a quality life. Today I want to talk to you in that vein of making choices I want to talk to you about overcoming temptation. Overcoming temptation. 
And I want to begin by asking you the question this morning. And I want you to really ponder this question in your mind. And in your mind and in your heart, I want you to try to answer this question. I want you to pretend that someone walks up to you and asks you the question, Who are you? Who are you? How would you answer that question? Who are you? Because when you know who you are, then you know what to do. When you know who you are, you know what to do. As individuals, our self-identity is so important for us. Because our self-identity tells us who we are, And it tells us where we're going. If you don't know who you are, you don't know what to do. If you don't know who you are, you don't know where to go. We have to understand who we are. Because knowing who you are gives you the ability and the strength and the courage to make right choices. Amen? This question came up with the church of Asia. And Peter wrote a letter to them, First Peter. Because they were struggling with their identity. And because they were struggling with their identity, they didn't they, they were losing focus of what they should do as children of God. And so Peter wrote this letter to them in 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter wrote this to them. And I want you to take these words to heart this morning. Peter said, but you are a chosen generation. Somebody say... I'm a chosen generation. Amen. He said, you are a royal priesthood. He was helping them to discover their identity in God. He said, you are a holy nation. You are His, God's own special people. Say, I'm special this morning. I'm special. Why? Because you're God's special people. Amen. Amen. Why do we understand? When we understand this, he says, Then you can proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Amen. Our greatest need today as a church, our greatest need in Christendom this morning is that we become who we already are in Christ. I want to say that again. That we become who we already are in Christ. The writer of Romans put it this way. He says that you might live in unity as a church, That you might grow up into maturity and to grow into the fullness and the full stature of Jesus Christ. What was he saying? He was saying you need to grow up in Christ that you become just like Him. But you can't do that if you don't know who you are. When we know who we are, then our decisions... Our choices will not be based on what feels good in the moment. And that's where people, most people stand. They make their choices based on how they feel right now. How do I feel right now? Instead of based on who they are in Christ Jesus. 
we let the devil run roughshod over us. Amen. We let him foist sickness and weakness and doubt and fear and confusion over onto us because we fail to claim and realize who we are in Christ Jesus. I am a child of God. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I belong to Him. I am complete in Jesus Christ. That's who I am. And when you know who you are, you can stand tooth and toenail with the devil and you can tell him, devil, get out of my way. I'm moving forward in the name of Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. Give Him praise today. Hallelujah. We need to begin to act on who we want to be in God. Amen. And as we said last week, our choices are based on our values. Our choices are based upon what we value as an individual. What do you value? In your life. And listen, your values are based upon who you are. Who you are. That's where you get your values. Now you may ask, so pastor, what does this have to do with overcoming temptation? Listen, when Jesus was in the wilderness, how many of you remember when he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and he was in the wilderness right after he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. The scripture tells us in Luke chapter 4, and being tempted by the devil, and the devil said to him, notice the first question the devil asked Jesus in the temptation. If you are Truly the Son of God. Then say to this stone, turn it into bread. You see, in the previous chapter, chapter 3, when Jesus was baptized in water, the Bible tells us when He came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon Him in bodily form, and a voice came from heaven and said unto Him, What? You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That was his identity. And the first thing the devil wanted him to question in his life was his identity in God. And that's what the devil will try to do with you. He'll try to get you to question your identity. Because if you question your own identity, you become weak and you become frail and you become uh, easy, easy prey for the devil. Somebody say amen. You see, it wasn't just about turning the stone into bread. It was about basically the devil saying, who do you think you are? Amen. How many of you have ever given in to temptation and then regretted it? Raise your hand. Come on. Have you ever given in to temptation and regretted it? Every one of us. There's not a person here today that has not given in to temptation and then immediately begin to regret it. We all have done that. And chances are, in most cases, when you gave in to temptation, you gave in to that temptation because you weren't prepared for what the devil threw your way. Amen? You just weren't prepared. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 13 says, Be on your guard. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Jesus told His disciples on the night that He was betrayed and crucified. In Matthew chapter 26, 41, He said, Watch and Pray lest you enter into temptation because the Spirit indeed is willing, but our flesh 
is weak. Amen. The problem with too many of us is we think we're going to stand on our own merit. We think we're going to stand in our own strength. Let me tell you something. You are no match for the devil. You are no match for your own flesh. You are no match for the deceitful thoughts you have in your heart. The only way you can stand up to the enemy and stand up to temptation is because you realize that greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. I don't stand against the devil on my own ability, my own strength, or my own merit. I do it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why did he warn us? Be on your guard. Why did they warn us? Watch, pray, be strong, be courageous. You know why? Because Paul and Jesus knew the devil's coming for you. If you haven't felt it already, it's coming. Amen. They tell us that we are in three, one of three modes in life throughout our entire life. We are either going in a trial, we are going through a trial, or we're coming out of a trial. That's where we live, saints of God. Why? Because the devil is coming after you. Our spiritual enemy, the devil, has a mission in life. And that mission is to steal, kill, and destroy anything and everything that matters to God. And you matter to God. You matter to God. And the devil wants to destroy you because he hates God. Amen? Paul warns us again in 2 Corinthians 2.11... Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. We cannot be ignorant of the fact that the devil is out to destroy us. Amen. And as children of God, as men and women of God, we need to know his plan. We need to know the devil's thoughts. We need to know his cunning. We need to know that He's skillful. We are not ignorant of the great number of stratagems in which He is constantly using to injure us and to destroy the souls of every person He possibly can. He's got your number. He's coming after you. And He, the Bible says, is full of wiles. That's an old word. Some of you may not understand what that word wiles means. But it means this. Devious, cunning stratagems employed in manipulating or persuading someone to do wrong. To miss the mark. To fall short of the grace and the glory of God. He's after you for that reason. And He knows where you're weak. If you think... You know Him. I want you to know the devil knows you. The Bible speaks of them as familiar spirits. Do you know why the Bible calls them familiar spirits? Because they're familiar with you. They're familiar with you. And they know how to attack us. They know our weak points. They know how to take us out of the will of God. They know how to hurt you. And more importantly than that, they know how to hurt the people around you. Because listen, the people you love and the people you care about, when the devil destroys you, he's going to go after them. Many times, you are what stands between the devil and your family and the devil and your friends. And you have to realize that uh, who you are in God. And stand up. Be courageous. Be strong. Be on your guard. Be watchful. Be in prayer. 
So we're going to be ready, amen? We're going to be ready. We're not going to let the devil catch us unaware. Amen? We're not going to let the devil sneak up on us. Because we know the devil is coming. And we're not ignorant of his devices. Amen? And we're not going to let him surprise us. But there are some practical ways that I want to touch real quickly. That clock up there is wrong and I'm running out of time. We're going to decide ahead of time. And this has been the the theme of my preaching for the last two weeks. We're not going to let things surprise us. We're going to be prepared. Amen? We're going to be prepared. And we're going to decide ahead of time that we're going to be overcomers. And the first step is we're going to determine to move the line. We're going to determine to move the line. Number two, we're going to predetermine, make up our minds ahead of time. Last week, what did we talk about? The power of a made-up mind. Okay? So we're going to make up our minds ahead of time that we're going to magnify the cost. First, we're going to move the line. Secondly, we're going to magnify the cost. And thirdly, we're going to decide ahead of time to plan our escape. Does anybody have a roll of tape? Anybody here have a roll of tape? I, I want to make an illustration. I, in fact, I need a roll of orange tape. Anybody have a, a roll of orange tape? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Vicky, you are amazing. Would you bring that to me? It is amazing that she would just have exactly what I need this morning. Oh, Lord, help me. I'm getting old. So there's the line. First step, we're going to learn to move the line. How many of you can see it? Can you see it, anybody? It's there. It's, it's, it's orange. It's, it's right here. This side over here is sin. This side over here is righteousness. Notice which side I'm standing on. This is not God's will. Amen? This is God's will. Amen? This side is right. That side is wrong. This side honors God. That side honors the devil. When there is a line, what do most people do? No, the majority of people, especially Christians, most of them are right here. They're right here. They camp out, right? This is where they live. They live as close to the line as they can get. Mickey, come here. Come here, Mickey. I just thought of this. I, I, I'm going to... Mickey... Yeah, come come and stand. You stand right here close to that line. Stand right there. Isn't that a nice shirt? All things. I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. So many people stand so close to the line. And when you stand close to the line, it's easy for the devil to trick you just like I tricked him. Amen? Amen. Too many people are standing too close to the line. They want to get... You can go down. 
Yeah, they want to get as close to this sin line as they can. Thank you. Yeah, give him a hand. He did a good job. Uh, yeah, he had the right words. Is exactly right. I can do all things. Amen. But so many people, they're right here. They want to see. They want to get just as close to that line as they can. And this is where they live their entire Christian life. They get so close to the line that it's easy for the devil to trick them. It's easy for the devil to pull them over. Amen. The problem is sin on that other side of the line will destroy your life. And so how do, I, how do I plan ahead of time that I'm not going to let the devil trick me? I'm going to move the line. And how do I move the line? I move the line by moving myself. I'm going to get as far away from that line as I possibly can. I'm not going to live on the edge of sin. I'm not going to live on the edge of temptation. I'm going to put myself in the position where I win with God. Amen. Give God praise. Our problem is we're living too close to sin. How many of you remember Cain? Cain and Abel. Do you remember they, they were to offer sacrifices to God? Somebody give Marco Corona. A welcome this morning. Marco, praise God, it's good to see you. Fresh from Korea. Amen. Marco used to be our praise and worship leader. Amen. We've been missing you. I sent you a text. You didn't respond. <laughs> Told you I missed you. Been thinking about you. Anyway, but you remember Cain. They offered sacrifices unto God. But Cain offered an unacceptable sacrifice to God. You remember that? Unacceptable. And God gave him a second chance. God went to Cain and said, Cain, don't you know if you do right, you'll be accepted? Do the right thing. Do the right thing. And you'll be accepted. But listen to what God said to him. If you do what is right, you will be accepted. This is Genesis 4 and 7. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. And its desire, sin's desire, is to have you. Amen? That's what God says to Cain. And then He says, Cain... You must rule over sin. You cannot let sin get the upper hand in your life. But see, what Cain tried to do was what many Christians try to do. He tried to walk the line. He tried to get just as far away from God and as close to sin as he could without missing out with God. And God said, you better be careful, Cain, because sin is crouching at your door like a lion and it's waiting to capture you. And you need to rule over it. Amen. I remember when I was a student pilot, we used to do a maneuver and we called that maneuver, turn around a point. Turn around a point. And what we would do, would we would select a stationary object. Most of the time it was a tower that reached maybe hundreds of feet above the ground. And we would point our wing at that target, that stationary object. And the object of the lesson was that you were to keep the same distance 
from that tower maybe that we were going around keep that same distance uh, as you were going around it uh, try not to, to lose the distance it gave you the ability it helped you to learn to, to be able to judge distance while you were flying in the air it also helped you to learn how that airplane flight maneuvering controls uh, how they operated and how they affected the course of your flight uh, it helped you to gain a solid understanding of the pitch or the roll or the yaw of that airplane and the object was not to get too close to that tower I want to ask you how stupid do you think it would have been if we would say let me see how close to the tower I can get without hitting it do you think that would have been smart but that's where a lot of Christians are. Let me see how close to sin I can get without crossing the line. I'm going to get just as close as I can. In the same way, if I know it's wrong, if I know it's sin, then I need to back off and say, no, I'm not getting near that. I'm not getting close to that. If I'm on a diet, hello? If I'm on a diet and I'm trying to lose weight, I don't stock up on junk food and soda pop. Take them home. Amen? You're going to lose. Amen? I like ding-dongs. I love ding-dongs. And I keep telling Sharon, don't buy those ding-dongs. Because if you buy them, I'll eat them. If I've got a spending problem, anybody? If I've got a spending problem, I don't spend all my time online looking at things I want and tempting myself. Stop it. Stop getting too close to the line. Understand I've got a weakness. Understand I'm tempted. Understand if I'm tempted, if I get too close, I'm going to fall over the line. Amen. Amen. If I have a problem with managing credit cards. Hello? If I've got my credit cards maxed out. And I'm still wanting to charge something on the credit card. So what do I do? I get on the phone with the credit card company. And what do I do? I say, can you increase my credit line? Because I've already spent all I have. And I want more. If you've got that problem, give the credit card to your wife. No, 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 no. Don't do that. You see, I can say that because I trust Sharon. I can say that because I trust her. Listen, if you've got a credit card and you keep maxing that thing out, it's going to take you 20 years to pay it off. Isn't that a shame? Isn't that a sin? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Cut the thing up. Throw it away. Stop charging. Determine in your heart, I'm going to pay this thing off. Amen? If I have a problem, listen to me now. If I have a problem with the opposite sex, If I have a problem, I'm not going to put myself in a situation where I'm tempted. I've had this rule for many, many, many years. I do not go anywhere and be with any one of the opposite sex alone. I don't go out to them with them to lunch. I don't spend time with them. Why? Because I eliminate the temptation beforehand. I've already made up my mind. I'm not going to fail in that way. Amen? 
Listen to what Job said. Job must have had a problem with women. He must have. Listen to what he says in Job chapter 31, verses 1 through 6. Sharon, I don't know what time it is. That clock is off. Five after. Give me just a few more minutes. Amen. Job said this. He said, I made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon the young maiden. What is he saying? I already made a plan how to handle this. And my plan is I'm not going to look at them. I'm not even going to gaze at them. I'm not going to do it because I'm tempted. And I'm not going to put myself in that position. Listen to why, what he said. Why then should I look upon a young woman? What's the purpose, he says. For what is the allotment of God from above? In other words, he says, first of all, I'm not going to do it. And, and, and why would I do it? And secondly, he says, I'm going to look at God and I'm going to see what God thinks about this. Amen? What does God think about this? For what is the allotment of God from above and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked? It is disaster for the workers of iniquity, he said. Does he not see my ways? And does he not count all my steps? In other words, Job says, I'm not going to try to fool God because God knows everything I do. He knows the thoughts I think. He knows the steps I take. I can't fool God, so I'm going to get on God's side. And I'm not going to play around with sin because I know the outcome of sin is that it's my destruction. Amen. Sin will destroy you. Jesus put it this way. He said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But Jesus said, I say to you, that whoever looks upon a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Boy, I wish I had another hour. Can I have another hour? Listen, if I have a problem with gossip, if I have a problem with tail-bearing, I'm not going to spend my time with someone who wants to drag me into gossip every time I talk to them. Amen? In fact, Proverbs says that you are to avoid that kind of person who gossips. Stop calling them. Stop associating with them because they will drag you into their sin. Oh, pastor, just gossip? Just gossip? That's going to take me to hell? Well, don't listen to me. Listen to the Word of God. Romans chapter 1, verses 29 through 32. Listen to the description that the Word of God gives to these kind of people who gossip and tail bear. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness. Evil. Greed. Depravity. They are full of envy and murder. Strife. Deceit and malice they are gossips they're slanderers they're God haters it's amazing to me they're insolent they're arrogant and boastful they invent ways to do evil and they disobey their parents and they have no understanding and no fidelity, no love and no mercy. And although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who also do them. 
That's harsh. That's hard. So how do I move the line? I move myself. I get myself as far away from this line as I possibly can. I'm not going to make myself easy prey for the enemy. I'm going to avoid people that help to pull me into sin. Amen? Number two, real quick, and I'm going to go through these quickly. We've got to ma- magnify the cost. Magnify the cost. We're going to magnify the cost because anytime we're tempted to give in to temptation, there's always a cost. There's always a risk. And what I want you to do is I want you to train yourself that when you're tempted to predetermine, to stop and ask yourself a question. When you're tempted to do something you know is wrong that you should not do, you need to learn to ask yourself a question. What could go wrong here? You need to ask yourself the question, What can go wrong? Because listen to me, something always goes wrong. Amen? The big question you can ask yourself is, what if the worst that could happen in this situation happens? Recently, I serve on the CEC in our conference. Recently, we had to deal with a minister who had a moral failure with an underage girl. And the bishop said to me, what was he thinking? And my response is, didn't he know he was going to get caught? Because you always get caught. And before you fall into sin, you need to ask yourself, what's going to be the results when I get caught? It will always happen. Listen, the devil doesn't make you sin or help you sin so he can keep it a secret. He's going to make sure the word gets out. What if you lose your reputation? What if you lose your marriage over this? What if you disgrace your family? What if you lose your ministry? And worst of all, what if you lose your soul? Listen, so many people think, well, you know, if I sin, I'll just go to God and ask Him to forgive me. He'll forgive me and it'll be all over. That's the way a lot of people think. God's a forgiving God. So if I sin, I'll just repent. And God will forgive me. I want to ask you a question. When you got saved, did it change you? Did it? When you got saved, when you gave your heart and your life to Jesus, and most of us, myself included, before I got saved, I thought I will never get saved. I will never give my life to God. I will not go to church. I don't like Christians. That was my attitude. I don't like those hypocrites. That's always just an excuse. It's never a reality. Amen? But something happened to me. God got a hold of me. And I gave my heart to Him. And I gave my life to Him. And He saved me. And when He saved me, He changed me. Hallelujah. He made me love Christianity. He made me love the church. He changed my life. He changed the way I thought. He changed my heart. He changed my attitude toward other people. He changed me. The Bible says old things will pass away. And behold, all things become new again. Praise God. When He saved you, He changed you. Amen. But I want to give you some advice here this morning. Sin also changes us. And this is what most people don't realize. If salvation will change you, sin will change you. And I've seen it happen and you've seen it happen time and time again. You've seen a child of God backslide on God, turn their back on the Lord, go out into the world. Maybe they were thinking, I'll just repent. I'll come back to God. I'll come back into the church. But once they got out there in sin and once the devil got a hold of them, they changed. 
Just like when they got saved, their thinking changed, their attitude changed, their heart changed. They became captured by sin, and they are now out in sin. And they may want to come back, uh, but they don't have the ability because sin changed their life. Amen. They fall into the trap of the devil. And they think, I'll easily get out of it, but sin is not easily gotten out of. Amen. I'm trying to hurry. Please bear with me. But this is an important message. You've seen it and I've seen it. People who have fallen into sin and they never recover. I've seen it happen to pastors and preachers who have fallen into sin. Listen to what Numbers 32 and 23 says. This is Moses talking to the children of Israel when they're about to go into the promised land. And some of them said, we don't want to go into the promised land. We like it right here. And we're asking you, can we stay here? Can we stay on this side of the Jordan? It was Gad and Reuben. They were the two that made the request. Can we stay on this side and make our homes here because we like it here? And Moses said, yes, you can do that. But first, you're going to help us go into the land and conquer it. You've got to go in with us, and you've got to conquer the land with us. And listen to what Moses said to them. But if you fail to do this, if you fail to do this, you will be sinning against the Lord, and you may be sure your sin will find you out. Your sin will find you out. Listen, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone will find out about your sin. It literally means that your sin is going to catch up with you. Sooner or later, our sins catch up with us. James 1, 14 and 15, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Don't blame it on the devil. We are tempted when we're drawn aside by our own desires and our own lusts. And when desire has conceived, it gives, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Listen to me. Five minutes of sin can wreck an entire lifetime of serving Jesus. And lastly, we're going to decide ahead of time a plan of escape. We're going to decide a plan of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation, no temptation has overtaken you except such is common to man. So don't ever think this is, just, this is unique to me. It's not. But God is faithful. Amen. God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able to bear. God's not going to allow you to get into a temptation that you can't overcome. But with every temptation... He will also make a way of escape for you that you may be able to bear it or overcome it. This first of all tells us that God is a faithful God. Somebody say, thank God He's faithful. Thank God I serve a faithful God. And God is going to keep us. And God will keep those people who want to be kept. Amen. God keeps those people who want to be kept. God will be with us in every temptation. Whenever you're in a temptation, can I tell you the first thing you do is look for God in this thing. Look for God in it. Because He's there. He's there with you. God is with us in every temptation. And He also offers His help. Let me help you. Let me help you get out of this. Let me help you overcome this. Let me give you the strength to say no to the devil. He's always there. And he's always there with those options. He offers a way of escape. The question is, am I going to look for the escape? Am I going to go to that door that God has opened and provided for me? Or am I going to ignore God's way of escape and enter into sin anyway? It's up to us. He always offers that way. But we have to be determined to follow His direction. Amen? Would you stand with me?
The devil's coming for you. His purpose, his aim is to destroy your reputation. He wants to destroy your witness. He wants to destroy your ministry. He wants to destroy your friendships. He wants to destroy your relationship with your spouse. He wants to destroy your witness before the kids. I have grown kids. Some of them aren't serving the Lord the way they ought to. But listen, I have determined I'm going to be an example to them. And I'm going to pray for them. When they look at my life, listen, they're going to look at a dad that loves them and loves God. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to serve the Lord. Because this one thing I know. Your kids may not always agree with the life you live because you're a Christian and a child of God. They may not agree with you, but they respect you because you've made a decision for God. And if you give in to temptation and you let the devil trip you up, think about what it's going to do to your kids. Because there's always consequences to sin. When we accept God's way of escape, listen, when you accept God's way of escape, it's freeing. It's liberating. When you accept God's way of escape, the joy of God will fill your life. Amen. You'll be filled with joy and Peace and grace will be increased and expanded in your life because you chose to do right and not wrong. It will give you liberty and grace. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Father in heaven, I need you today. I need the grace that only you can give. I need the love that comes only from you. I need the help that comes only from heaven. God, I can't stand on my own. I'm not strong enough, Lord. I'm not able to face the enemy by myself. I need you, Lord. And I know you're faithful. I know you're always there. I know you're always offering a way out for me. I trust you, God. I trust you. I surrender all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Would you sing that chorus again? Hallelujah. I surrender all. I do, Lord. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I, I surrender, surrender all, right where You are. Will you surrender your all to Him today? Will you give it to Jesus? Will you put your life in His hands? Will you tell Him how much you need Him and need His strength, need His grace and His mercy and His love? Will you just lift your heart and your hands and your voice to the Lord and say, I need you, God. I need you in my life. Hallelujah. I need Jesus.